Greetings, Reclaimers. I am 343 Guilty Spark, monitor of Podcast Evolved. Protocol dictates that you must listen. Come. We have a wealth of knowledge to share with you, and you don't want to make my blue eye red. Do you, Reclaimers? to another Halo Book Club episode. This is a part of Halo Podcast Evolves, your home for Halo. I am your host, Krista, your gracious host, here to walk you through all things books and Halo. With me here today is Aaron. Hi, guys. And David. Hello, everybody. And this month's book club is Halo Shadows of Reach. We actually got it pretty early, so we're actually recording this before the book's even out. Hooray! <laughs> we're actually on top of things this time. Oh, this, we were not on top of things. This came in so hot, it made, like, the owl at the start of this look like it came in and had a smooth landing. I think we all finished the book today, right? I finished yeah. it today. <laughs> I finished the book 45 minutes ago. Wow! <laughs> I, yeah, I'm about the same time, actually. <laughs> You remember when we used to record the book club like a month after the book came out? No, I don't remember that. Yeah, we used to do that. I know you don't remember it, but that's what we used to do. Anyway, before we get started, check out our awesome website, halopodcastevolves.com or just halopodcast.com. It features all of our shows, which include Podcast Evolved, our main show and weekly episodes that alternate between lore discussions and the latest on Halo and Xbox news. We also have Mission Debrief, a deep dive into every Halo games campaign, mission by mission. Right now we are at the very end of Halo Wars 2. We're going over the DLC. And of course, we have our newest show, Builds with Blocks, which is centered around the micro action figures and brick-based construction sets of the Halo universe. If you like us, take a gander at our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Halo Podcast Evolved. We offer a variety of exclusive rewards to our patrons like early episodes and swag. We would like to take this moment to thank our patrons for their continued support. Thank you! Yes, thank you. And finally, we encourage our listeners who want to listen to and support us and support our Audible to go ahead and check out Audible's growing collection of Halo novels that are all in one place, along with a bunch of other novels and stuff for you to look at. So go to the URL, audibletrial.com slash Halo, or slash just podcast evolved, audibletrial.com slash podcast evolved, to learn more and start your free trial today. It does help us very much. So if you're looking for a place to listen and not read Halo books, check it out. And now I'm going to throw it to David to kind of kind of give us a little, you know, a little teaser of what we're about to go through, um, what we're about to discuss. David? You want me to do all the stats? Do all of the big stats, yeah. All of the stats. So, title, Halos. Halo, Shadows of Reach. Everybody knows, should know this. The author is Troy Denning. Hi, Troy. I know he listens. I hope he listens. He listens to our last ones anyway. Hopefully we don't get anything wrong in this one, Troy. <laughs> He's going to come with, like, a list. <laughs> Um, the publisher is Simon & Schuster, or is that Gallery Books? Is that the same? I don't know They're how that works. They're the same works. thing, yeah. They're the same thing? Okay. Formats is all. Is it all? It's not audio yet, is it? There is an audiobook coming. Oh, there's an audiobook coming. Probably you should notice here is that this book has a unique... Feature? Feature, yeah, I guess. Um, there, Walmart apparently have this book that has an extra section in it. Uh, I think it's either like a prologue or epilogue. I can't remember how they word it. And that's unique to that. It isn't written by Troy, uh, but obviously it's written by the, the 343 team. So we don't know what it's about. 
because none of us could get a copy of that book and uh, because also it's not out yet at the time of recording but Troy had said it's not really anything that takes away from you're not missing anything by reading from uh, from this so uh, we'll obviously talk about it at another time probably on a regular show at some stage that is what I will say about the formats so just be aware if you're listening to this after reading your book might be different than ours um, so if we don't talk about that particular section that's why the release date is officially October 20th, 2020, and uh, the length is 415 pages, and the timeline is based pretty much around October of 2559. So this is the furthest forward in the Halo timeline of any media that we have to date, which is really exciting, and uh, because we get real close to Halo Infinite, guys, where the book pretty much entirely uh, takes place in and around Reach, so we, there's no planet hopping, character hopping stuff in this book. We're all in and around reach. Um, and what I will do now is give you the quick summary from the back of the book, and then we'll get going in our discussion. So the date is October 2559. It has been a year since the renegade artificial intelligence Cortana issued a galaxy-wide ultimatum, subjecting many worlds to martial law under the indomitable grip of her foreigner weapons, aka Guardians. Outside her view, the members of Blue Team John 117, the Master Chief, Fred 104, Kelly 087, and Linda 058 are assigned from the UNSC Infinity to make a covert insertion into the ravaged planet of Reach, their former home and training ground, and the site of humanity's most cataclysmic military defeat near the end of the Covenant War, Reach still hides a myriad secrets after all these years. Blue Team's mission is to penetrate the rubble-filled depths of Castle Base and recover the top secret assets locked away in Dr. Katrin Halsey's abandoned laboratory, assets that may prove to be humanity's last hope against Cortana. But Reach has been invaded by a powerful and ruthless alien faction who have their own reasons for being there. Establishing themselves as a vicious occupying force on the devastated planet, this enemy will soon transform Blue Team's simple retrieval operation into a full-blown crisis. And with the fate of the galaxy hanging in the balance, mission failure is not an option. Alright, do we want to just kick off with just a quick two-minute summary of the entire book and then we'll get into some of the nice details that we want to go over? Are you prepared to summarize an entire book in two minutes, Krista? So prepared, it's going to be really fun. Go for it. So Halo Shadows of Reach obviously starts out with Blue Team inserting onto Reach in a owl, which is actually like a stealth pelican. Of course, Blue Team has come not only with, you know, all four members, they've also come with kind of the special crew, which uh, consists of a couple individuals, and we'll get into them a bit later. And of course, we also have some excavation equipment because obviously the entire base, sword base, is kind of buried under rubble and stuff like that from the ending of Halo First Strike. So the team inserts automatically draws a bunch of banished and or whatever Covenant force is out there attention. At this point, we don't know exactly, you know, what's attacking them. They're forced to crash land and then quickly, you know, start making their way across the glass. During their journey across the glass, they pretty much figure out that they're not the only humans here, and there's also a lot of banished here, and they're, the banished, they're kind of acting a little weird. They're not acting like the normal banished, they're acting a little more smarter. It's pretty much what, what it is. Uh, at first, Chief thinks it's the Keepers. Of course, it does end up being the Keepers, but Chief doesn't know this at this point, so he's a bit, they're all a bit confused, and they just kind of start going through the glass and figuring out what they need to do next. Pretty soon afterwards, they find some of the human settlements that are kind of littered around the landscape. The humans and the banished have been pretty much fighting for the past couple weeks uh, since the banished arrived and started taking over their shit. And that doesn't make the humans very happy. We go into a human settlement pretty much just to get a vehicle to distract the banished and draw them away from blue team at one point. And that's when we kind of find the entire hey, Reach Militia. And they're like, uh, you're coming with us because you're definitely here to save us, right? Chief's like, no. And they're like, you're here to save us. Of course, Chief's a big softie for Reach and he ends up going with the Militia. They make a plan, they do some stuff. And a huge battle on Reach ensues with the Militia trying to take a banished armory, destroy some of the vehicles. And of course, get some help from the UNSC. And it all kind of comes in a huge fight scene that's super epic and super fun. After Reach is kind of liberated, 
Blue team, of course, go right back to the mission they're supposed to be doing and fly over to the shaft, which is all that is left of Sword Base is just this huge shaft in the middle of nowhere, not even under a mountain or anything like that. And of course they go to the shaft. All the Banisher are there because the Banisher are actually not there for Sword Base. They're actually there for the Forerunner installation that is under Sword Base that has a portal. The magical portal is going to help them reach Atriox because they have some of the Slip Space gem from Halo First Strike. There's a lot of First Strike stuff in this. The Banished and uh, Blue Team are kind of after the same thing. The Banished kind of figure that out and follow Blue Team to where they're going to be going. And that's how they find Sword Base. So they're both, there's a big battle over Sword Base. Eventually Blue Team succeed. I'll jump in and say Castle Base, not Sword Base, because someone will be listening and correct us. Is it Castle Base? Damn. Okay, I've been, I said Sword Base through the whole thing. Fuck. Yeah, it's all Castle Base. Sword Base is the one from Reach. I get it confused too. Sorry, it's all Castle Base. I'm so sorry. <laughs> So of course, Blue Team are looking for Dr. Halsey's assets, the Banisher looking for the portal, and both are under Castle Base, and they're pretty much after the same thing. Uh, Blue Team are able to clear the shaft, though some Banished get into the Forerunner structure. And Blue Team get the assets, unfortunately the Banished also get their assets, and everybody evacuates Reach because a huge slip space portal is opened. And our big boy Atriox comes through, which is obviously going to make Cortana a little suspicious. That is like the super like long and short summary. There's a lot more than this in the book, but that is like the two minute summary. Was it two minutes, guys? Did I do good? It was close. It was close. 159. Nailed it, Krista. Damn. Hell yeah. So do we want to get into some specifics? Um, does anyone want to go over, like, special team? Or would do they call it spe- it's special something, right? Special crew. They were special crew. I think, it, I, well, I want to say at the, at the start, I thought, okay, the team is dropping in in an, an owl. And, and there was that's like a Troy thing. He introduced that in one of his previous books. Um, I think the first one, um, yeah. which is like the stealth pelican, which is cool. I love the maneuver that they do, what, that they figure out. They do. They're going to, like... They're pretending to be like a meteorite blowing up. He does this insane maneuver where he flips the ship backwards and shoots rockets out that explode like particles. And then it like rapidly descends, cools so it can engage in its stealth suite. And it slows down so that like the the ships that follow it think it was a meteorite that blew up. And then they have to investigate the area to kind of make sure. I love all that stuff. That was such a cool idea. The way to stealth insert something that clearly generating too much heat as like you know a planet entry to to get out and they talk about that like a lot you know sensors and visibility and night vision and heat and infrared you know i mean it's a big thing about what sensors this thing has and what it can see and then they're making assumptions based on that and i found that kind of very technically interesting about like the things that obviously humanity has for some reason an upper hand at night time operations because we have a better suite of sensors for like night vision stuff. I thought that was pretty cool. But anyway, the owl insertion at the start and introducing these these the special crew, I thought was pretty cool. And even though it, it is a pelican and it does immediately crash, it was a cool crash. Well, what do you expect? All the pelicans in this crash. I thought Troy might keep at least one pelican alive. <laughs> they even left some pelicans behind at the end. There was actually a lot of... Um air combat in this book, which I found extremely refreshing and nice. There's a bunch of broadswords and longswords that kind of come in during the really big battles and set pieces of this novel. The longsword is like a reveal. The special package is being prepped for this fucking Covenant Corvette. You're like, ooh, what's the special package? And it's a bunch of longswords and then everybody, like all the banished shit themselves when the fucking longswords show up. I thought that was awesome. I love that it showed humanity's air superiority, like how better we were in terms of like the tactics than to the banished with our with our vehicles and stuff. And it seemed that like humanity's downside was ammunition and fuel, as opposed to like our tactics were superior to the banished. I thought that was so interesting of how like we can only stay here for so long because we run out of ammunition and fuel, we have to fuck off. Even though we just kicked ass. I mean I, I thought that was cool. All the air stuff was was definitely very refreshing. So good. I get a little bored of the ground combat because every halo book does ground combat of course because it's you're usually following a spartan or something something similar 
and so there's always a lot of ground combat in the books. But the air combat was very refreshing. It was very nice to have kind of the these layers. Troy Denning did a very good job at layering these battles. What are the normal Marines doing, or just boots on the ground? What are what is the cavalry doing? What are the, what is the air doing? And it just kind of builds from there. So you kind of get a very uh, good sense of everything that's going on in the battle, which I found very very fun. Also, Troy Denning is working with these huge set pieces. Like, at one of the battles, literally a hundred Spartans drop from the Infinity. I thought that big battle was awesome, especially because it was told as Chief commanding it. And I thought that was really interesting to see Chief change from a four-man commanding, let's say, a four-man team to Chief commanding a whole battle of hundreds of people. If not, no, thousands even. Wasn't there, there, there there's thousands in the militia? I thought that was super cool and how like he interacted with the militia was very interesting i thought it was awesome and even like there's like great moments with him and like chap chapov yeah chapov he's one of the special crew yeah he's a wonderful internal moment of like realizing who he is his status within the military and to be seen by civilians and people outside it and realizing that it's maybe not it's part of his job now to kind of maybe train and like reinforce new people coming up and that like he kind of took this fellow under his wing a little bit and i really like like that and then obviously that came to a sad end because troy loves to make characters we care about and kill them because he's a jerk thanks troy thanks troy when you were talking about that a little bit with chap of it when he takes him under his wing it's i thought it was really cute that blue team are having banter and they've included chap of with it but he doesn't because they're so dry and droll he thinks they're being mean to him and he doesn't realize that <laughs> no, we're actually being nice to you and this is how we get on. And he has to give him like a little symbolic pat in the back and go like, here, you sit in the front seat. I'll sit back here. You sit next to the cute girl. Yeah, and then you also realise that he actually put Chapov in the front because there's no way he could hold on to the back of the fucking warthog while she drives. Yeah. I love that little line when he looks over to Fred and Fred's holding on to the side and he's like, no, no, you want to put your arm around the roll bar? And then the warthog takes off and he looks over and he's like, see, did you put your arm around it? I actually really liked that character. Her name was Bella and she was a buggy champion and she did a lot of the driving. And she's just like, Chief, you've never driven with someone like me. And Chief's like, oh, shit. I thought she was fantastic. She was the one death that I was actually super bummed with. Because I thought she was fantastic. Like the warthog scenes of her driving was awesome. And like, it sounds like because every Halo player knows what a Warhog drives like. So having it described as her doing crazy shit and like the scene of her driving into the Phantom I thought was incredible. I loved that plan. And it's just her like destroying Sangheili and Brutes by like just like revving the engine and spinning the tires on them and ripping their arms. Like that was so fucking cool. The idea that you can, which she does the maneuver to get into the ramp where she breaks the Warthog hard and it, pushes down on the front springs and then she accelerates and it like leaps up into the air and I'm like if you could do stuff like that and reach finally steps would no longer be a challenge Hell or you yeah. could do it in infinite like you know there's always that bit in the game where you go like oh I can't get the warthog up this ledge and now you can just like bunny hop it but that's how everyone gets around things like you just put something slightly smaller in front of the warthog and just kind of bump it up a little bit. What if you didn't need to? What if you could make the warthog jump by itself? You have to be a five time winner. Yeah, <laughs> she says it so many times. They do make a point of her being an incredible driver, but it, I thought it was, it was pretty good. There were great scenes. Super. I knew she was dying, especially when they made the comment of like, Chief says, you know, remember to keep the passenger side facing the enemy or whatever so you don't get shot. I was like, oh, this girl's getting shot. Do we want to just talk about Blue Team and Chief? Because I feel like Chief's inner monologue in this book is very different than any other inner monologue we've kind of seen him with. He's grown up. Yeah, he, he, he definitely... This is. I thought like, Chief's monologue is wonderful in terms of like you. You get an older person. You, he seems to have come a very, very uh, come come along very far since the last time we've seen him in a book. I mean, not even in a Troy book, but let's say when was the last content we had where, where Chief was in it? Let's say pre Halo Five. Like First Strike. No, was it? Yeah, that's the only other Chief book. Yeah. Then it was Silent Storm and. They were all young, They're Chief. All prequel books. Oh, that's crazy. Okay. That's really weird to think about. That's actually a good point, though. That might be why Chief's monologues seemed so vastly different than what we've what we've read him in. 
because this is we haven't heard his inner monologue since 2552. But even there's got to be comics that are set after Halo 4. The problem is like the comics don't have much of an inner monologue with them. Yeah, well, that's true. The thing I like about it is he's contemplating the choices he made in Halo 5 and how he's going to have to like be responsible for them someday. He's like, when all this is over, someone's going to hold me account for going AWOL and that. He's kind of accepted it too. Yeah, and like with Halsey as well, he's not really holding a grudge against Halsey, but there's a bit of trust gone there. You can feel like he doesn't entirely trust her the way he used to. Yeah, I thought it was an in- the interesting conversation of, did Halsey set them up on this planet? Have they just been set up? Did she sold them out for some reason? I thought that was really interesting. I didn't believe it for a second, but I did think it was cool that like the characters in World, especially the blue team, are considering, did Halsey fuck up? Do you know, I thought that was cool. It's a viable option because she's done it before. Well, and you also have to remember that Halsey's been kind of off the rails for a while now considering her joining Jewel and her issues with Oni and being captured in Glasslands. Can I ask a Halsey question while we're here? Sure. The little hint at the end where Halsey kind of staggers and grabs on to Chief, do we think we're hinting at the death of Halsey? No, that wasn't physical. I think that was emotional. Yeah, that was an emotional reaction because throughout the book, Chief thinks of Blue Team as like a percentage. So when one of them gets in- injured, the percentage goes down of their effectiveness. At the end of the book, they're at like 58% effectiveness, and they're fucked up. Yeah, they make a big deal of how like how messed up Blue Team is, that they're like, the ODCs don't want to even look at them, because these are these immortal warriors that are now visibly fucked up. I like the idea of, well obviously her armor is totally cracked at the end of Halo 4, and that like she is an emotional wreck, and that she is very emotionally you know invested in blue team now like especially blue team so i think seeing them all messed up really messes with her and obviously you're going to see chinks in her armor come through like this and i think that's great but she's also very very old yeah she is very old she's a very old lady isn't she like in her late 70s 60s 70s no she's in her 60s yeah. she's not in her 70s i don't think is she not in her 70s you talk and i'll google halsey Halsey's interesting because she does have this connection, but she also, like, gets shit done. She has this issue with, like, she she knows that what needs to be done, and she knows the sacrifices that need to be made, but she has a hard time coping with the sacrifices when they actually happen. And so Halsey sound, sends Blue Team down to the planet. She knows that it's a, that something could happen, and the, but then when she physically sees how fucked up Blue Team is, she feels really bad about it because she sent them down there. She's 67. Oh shit, she's old. That's not that old. And again, this is like future humans. They probably have a way different life. Perengoski is, you know, infinite. Yeah, she's like 150 or some shit. I think Halsey, with, you know, the access that she has to various technologies, I'm she's fucking, she's fine. Like, she's got an uber arm. She's got a Spartan arm now, probably. She does, she does. She has like, they, they gave her a mechanized arm. She just looks a lot frailer. She just sounds like they're making her sound uh, elder a bit more, which makes sense because she's been through a lot. I, I like how she's portrayed in this book that she's not even in it a lot. I like that. That was good too. She's maybe one or two chapters from her point of view. It's just one, yeah. I was hoping there was more because I was like super surprised and very pleased when I got to that chapter, but. Yeah, but then that was a very interesting take and it was great. That gives you so much information, but obviously not a lot of like the current state of the UNSC and obviously that like this is a year after like Halo 5 which is huge in terms of like Cortana's crackdown and how like okay Infinity is still operating by itself it's doing the run to like they're I, I like how they've explained the scale and that like okay Cortana will be alerted in these circumstances and that they know to operate beneath them I thought that was cool and that even the Banished were doing that as well I thought that was awesome they send all these ships out to jam the whole planet and then destroy all these satellites so that they don't send any like link to waypoint. Thought that was cool. Like we said before, it's very Battlestar Galactica. It's just the last ship on the run because there's a line Chief says at some point where he's like, you know, the task force if whatever. And then in his head, Chief goes, I don't know if you can call the Infinity a task force anymore because it's just one ship and a couple of escorts. He's like really selling the idea that there ain't much left. Yeah, I like that. 
but that like bridge scene was great because obviously it reintroduced Palmer, brought in Lasky. You have a few other characters in there around the bridge, and Infinity is obviously still running really well, which is a good sign. But I love the idea of the stories being told in the last year, let's say, of the Battlestar Galactica style story that we know is in there and that happened as they jump from planets to planets. And obviously, there must be like re equipping somewhere. Do you know what I mean? There's got to be an element of them moving around the guardians do you know what i mean getting in between the gaps and stuff like that i think that sounds really cool you know fine rightly they've been buying their supplies from venezia because that's the only planet that sells <laughs> weapons in the halo universe <laughs> yeah that's true everything comes from venezia we were talking about this before the show we have i think mixed opinions on underground living once again <laughs> featuring the Troy book. i like the idea that you think there's only a couple of colonists living on a farm chiseling away at the glass and then you find out it's actually a few thousand colonists living under the glass I, I there's something cool about that i also love that their mission isn't like they're not harvesting the glass to use as a resource they are in fact trying to repopulate the planet and re um terraform it i thought that was cool that, that that's what they were doing they were trying to create farmland and it wasn't the same as meridian because that was where my touchstone went from my brain of visualizing anything being described on the planet is like what does meridian look like and what did it look like to like fight on meridian and stuff like that i like that it's is it uh, baldassar is it you call her the woman that's in charge i like how her family are like reach old money miners so they've decided that the way to save reach is they're going like Reach is still full of resources. We can mine the titanium and sell it to rebuild the colony. That's her family goal. They're big agriculture and mining companies. And I love that. She was an interesting character too. I liked, I liked how the militia was portrayed as like crazy diehard psychos. <laughs> but Chief is like totally vibing with them. He's like, I really want to help them. Can we find a way to help them? And they were like, imagine what they were like if they were trained. It's like, it's like, um, I think I do think it was pretty cool. There were some annoying characters for sure of, oh my god, I could feel Chief's pain and anguish of dealing with these people. <laughs> yeah. But they are kind of, they're civilians. I think Chief mentions it a couple of times. He was never really trained for civilians. He, like, he, he's barely trained to make small talk with people, never mind anything else. And this is all just stuff he's having to figure out. But I love the couple of la- times when he's, I could totally get a job in the diplomatic corps. Like, I could sort this shit out. I did think that was pretty funny. Chief the Peacemaker comments on things Fred was saying and stuff like that. Yeah, it is a a position for us in the diplomatic corps. There was also like this moment where Chief was uh, dealing with the militia and she I think she was transporting him or something like that and she had this necklace that had some pictures on it and Chief's like really stressed about asking her about it. He's like, oh Jesus, I'm not good at personal questions, but then he ends up doing it and I'm like, I'm so proud of you. It's the doctor. I love her interaction with him because she's like, why did you want me here if you're not going to take any of my advice? And he's like, I was ordered to report to you for a checkup. He's just, he's not having any of it. She's like, you need to stay off that leg for a week. And he's like, not happening. You need to take it easy. Not happening. And then I love that he can like copy and paste his medical data and Bluetooth it to your handset. You want some medical readings? Here you go. Yeah. That's pretty much all you're getting because you can't scan through the suit and the suit's not coming off. So I was like, okay, do what you can. Interesting point to the suit not coming off. Do we want to touch on one development? Or do we want to leave a list of things we think will be in infinite at the end? Yeah, we have a list. I, another moment I really liked with Fred. Fred's very good throughout this whole book. Because Fred's kind of... He has a really good sense of humor compared to the other ones. The other members of Blue Team. He has the most normal sense of humor, I guess. He's like a people person. He's like a Spartan version of a people person. He's got a girlfriend. He does have a girlfriend, yeah. How lucky. At one point, Fred has to like, he has like a concussion. He has to sit around with his head uh, helmet off. And uh, they're obviously flashing the different like uh, colors and stuff in the helmet. And everyone's like, did your helmet just flash some colors at you? Is it trying to talk to you? And Fred's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh yeah, Fred with concussion was pretty Oh my God, he was really, he's like, do I have a hangover? Am I drunk? I did think it was great where he was trying to tell the militia, like, at the very start when they're blowing the tunnel, like, you have this many explosives in this tunnel. Oh, my God, you don't understand. He starts quoting all these things. And they're like, yeah, whatever, it's fine, it's fine. I'll blow it up. We blow this shit up all the time. 
and then they fucking like cripple themselves with the uh, the underground shockwave that they generate that's one thing i have to say that i loved about this and the comment is they like they're on reach and they've been pillaging reaches reach is just left there's so much equipment and weapons on reach i love that this book just has Anything that they want, they have. It leads to a very different story where it's always scrounging. Do you know what I mean? I always feel like your team, when we're reading these books and playing, you're constantly scrounging, scrounging, scrounging. I love how they have everything. They have all the crazy explosives. They have fucking Havocs that they're trying to convince them not to use. I thought that was wonderful. And I, I love that they just, they just had the shit they needed. And they didn't have to, like, easy, they could easily explain it. I thought that was cool. I said, it's not like having to deal with the kids on the planet and the spider walkers and the couple of bits of equipment left. The crazy microwave gun or whatever. Well, they are kind of the underdog, but they're the very well-equipped underdog. All they were short of was aircraft. Spider children. Do we have anything else we want to talk about when it comes to, like, the human characters, blue team, stuff like that? I have one, actually. Kelly listens to Queen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I kind of loved that. It was really subtle, but it was like, oh my god! It was really funny. Obviously, it's all John's point of view, and you have Fred being Fred, just being generally excellent and having a good personality. They did something new with Kelly, introducing her. She likes music and obviously high tempo stuff to kind of relax herself and get her into like her like pre-battle kind of like mantra. Um, I thought it was cool because Kelly has a bit of dialogue not really fleshed out and linda is the exact same linda always is linda's very you know methodical and quiet they did mention norn fang a couple of times which i really appreciate norn fang got thrown a lot but linda's always very calm and quiet she she's also a badass though master chief just like puts her puts her in different like sniper posts throughout the book and she just fucking shreds through people (laughs) Hmm. the only thing i find sort of weird about it is Queen doesn't seem like the sort of music to pump me up before battle. I would have had her down as like a Slipknot fan. I don't know, but I don't bump, bump. Another world bites the dust. I don't know, it's kind of fun. <laughs> she listens to that and then she listens to Killer Queen, which is talking about like dynamite and laser beams and shit like that. I'm sure Kelly would love that shit. She is the Killer Queen. Um, Do we want to go into uh, some of the uh, what's going on with the uh, Banished and Keepers and the dynamic? Yeah, like we should talk about caster signed up to the banished which is crazy i mean it's not out of the realm of possibility it was very believable because caster and atriox were buddy buddy uh when they were younger did we know that or was that a i don't think we knew that i thought they mentioned it before yeah i remember troy had introduced banished as like it was literally a send or like he was mentioned there may, may have mentioned banished in previous books just to bring them into the universe. I thought there was something along the lines of we could do this with the banished and casters like no absolutely not they're not faithful and I thought they hinted at some sort of a relationship with Atriox vaguely. Yeah. But he definitely hints at like the banished aren't in it for the religion. He like I think Caster outright says that at one point. The interesting thing is Caster's still very religious and all about that but at some point he's just like i need to join the banished because they're of course going to look for different weapons and stuff like that and you know we can both benefit each other did he say it all did the oracle send him to the banished i can't remember they joined forces pretty much after cortana showed up and they're like oh fuck we have to like unify unify to kind of like get anything done or whatever i think to help each other and i think that's kind of what happened we obviously get a lot of caster. We get a lot of Eshiram, which is really great because he's he was a very misnomer in all of the Halo Infinite trailers. Uh, we get some. We get a little bit of Atriox, and then we get a bunch of other people like uh, Gadogai, which is the Sangheili Blade Master. He's kind of Eshiram's eyes, I guess, because uh, Caster's kind of sent to look for the portal under the mountain which will connect him with Atriox using a slip space crystal, and so. They pretty much posted him on Reach, and they're like, I don't know where the fuck it is. It's under a mountain or some shit. You should probably fucking find it. And Caster's like, uh, okay. <laughs> also, can we mention that it's not just any slip space crystal. It's the slip space crystal from First Strike. I loved how they finally brought that back. Because it was obviously that stuff from the soul. I thought it was great. I'm kind of curious as to why the Dreadnought's not operational, though. Because he says... He sent a message back telling Eshram 
to activate the portal. He found Truth's ship. He found the shards. He didn't take the Dreadnought back to the galaxy, which makes me wonder, was it not operational? Or maybe he just couldn't figure it out or something like that. Or, I mean, maybe Atriax just doesn't care enough. The Dreadnought's super powerful, but maybe it's just too much of a hassle to kind of figure out the Forerunner controls on it. He has what he needs. Maybe he doesn't need it. It is confirmed that the Dreadnought is still there. And it's by... It's not even by High Charity, is it? It's just somewhere in, on the Ark. It docked somewhere because it's not in the battle with the Brutes when you first go to the Ark with Chief. Yeah, it's just... You never really hear of it again, so you imagine it was Brute landed it normally and then it's never heard of again. But do you think, like, if he had the Dreadnought, if he could use it, surely he would have just wiped out the Spirit of Fire and that would have been the end of it? Yeah, there's obviously something keeping it from the fight. And I'm sure we'll... I mean, it could be Medicam Bias, who knows? (laughs) Yes, a certain Forerunner AI, someday. I do love the Keepers and the Banished and how the Banished seem to be... When Aatrox is not around, like, he is their all-guiding force and they did a great job of building up Iskarum, of being Aatrox Mini, of being like, he's just as badass, Aatrox seems to love him and that, like, everybody pretty much respects and fears him. This is obviously a great setup for what's going to be Halo Infinite. So I like these characters being introduced, these leaders of these clans. I like the idea of us maybe seeing these clans in Infinite and I think that's kind of cool and the three party setup of the three of them meeting that whole meeting scene was really cool how they they meet on this glass that's like covered over like this boiling sulfur and it's a thin layer of glass that's still there so like it's pretty much hinted that if we start fighting with our gravity hammers we'll kill each other I think that whole scene and setup was really cool having Ustalang go to die there and how smarmy he is how he doesn't wear armor he just has his sword on his hip it's just like a badass like it's just like yeah no bother i wanted to see how he was going to kill some brutes barehanded i was waiting so <laughs> patiently he's just being talked about as being this killer you know that joke in the simpsons when like the mafia and the yakuza and all are fighting outside homer's house and he's like but mars the little guy hasn't done anything yet and she takes him back into the house and then he hears a load of bodies fall over and he's like oh <laughs> i just imagine that's what this would be like off scene is better than in scene. Yeah, of just just what he can do. He sounds badass. I'm glad that he that that ending was pretty cool too. It did seem a little bit like, oh wait, you're just going to join them, just like that. Him and Caster did have like a bromance going along the whole time. You can hear it's like, if you told me that the two of them were wildly in love and it was Brokeback <laughs> Mountain, I would totally believe it. They had a great relationship. I thought I was really happy that it, it, he's gone to the Ark now. Yeah, the Sanghealy actually defected from uh, the Banished and went off with the caster. Because I didn't think this was going to happen, but I guess it, it did. I was very shocked. They actually got the portal to open, which I'm like, oh, fuck, what? Yeah, and it's because he had some humans with him. Yeah, well, let's, let's, that's, that's a whole nother thing. Let's, let's, let's get into that after the portal. <laughs> a drop from the, uh, I was like, what the fuck? That is so bad. That is that is worst case scenario for the Halo universe at this point. Like, Atriox coming back from the Ark is the worst. It's good for us because it's, like, super epic and cool, but holy fuck. This is going to be bad because all of our Halo Infinite theories up until now assumed that Atriox was going to be trapped on the Ark. I think it's very interesting that they've pretty much pegged that the Ark failed for him whatever he was there to do didn't happen so obviously the loss of his of enduring conviction and the kind of let's say the um the awakening of the nightmare stuff pretty much killed whatever Aatrox was actually trying to do over there he left all his forces there to hold the Ark while he just bails the fuck out and comes back to like the greater Halo universe that, I think that's very interesting and obviously kind of sets sets the stage for like what he's going to do next and what his plan he has a greater purpose or he has plans that he's now back to enact. I think that's fascinating. It angers me twice now that Atriox has gone off to do things and we don't know what the fuck he's doing anywhere. He went to the Ark and we don't know his reasons. And then he comes back from the Ark and he's like, right, motherfuckers, we are away on a new mission. You're like, would you tell us something, anything? That scene where Atriox was like, we have a new thing to do. And I'm like, oh, and Caster's like, I'm not going to ask. I'm like, oh, (laughs) yeah. I was like, he wouldn't have told Caster anyway. 
maybe we do we will know because the Scarum should probably know this information so like maybe as we get to see what Skyrim knows in Infinite we'll get maybe a hint of what Aatrox is doing and also Aatrox, is Aatrox in Infinite? We can talk about this later but let's just say I did say that scene where Aatrox comes back and then Gadai starts introducing the various captains I'm like okay these are the boss battles in Halo Infinite straight away I was it was like, even okay, it yeah. was just like Jata Radum, and he's this, uh, you know, short tempered. He has a backstory. This guy has a backstory. This guy's the scourge maker. I'm like, okay. It almost sounded very nearly like a nemesis system. You have this whole load of people, but I was wondering, do you think between the clans fighting Unreached, do you think that'll be like the setup for Infinite? Do you think you'll have different banished territories held by different factions and you'll have to, like, take out their command structure? Probably. A hundred percent, that's what I'm thinking. And I think there's probably... Obviously, they've taken the Keepers out of it. They were obviously very antagonistic with the other kind of groups where, like, obviously, they didn't even view the Keepers as being proper banished. So they're now taken out of the picture. So all we're just going to have is banished clans, which I think is, is fine. But I think it's also super interesting to see how the humans were actually playing up into, like, those kind of tactics of setting the clans against each other in this but i think that that's absolutely a precursor to what you're i think what infinite's going to be like i said if it's going to be you building a resistance and i love the idea of you playing the clans maybe against each other that's super cool i'm 100 percent down with that that kind of um that kind of gameplay and obviously introducing the clans as having clan names and like corpse moon that's awesome ravaged tusks i'm down with that i'm down with some cool badass named clans that we're going to fight and having these boss-like characters being under a scarum definitely fuck yeah okay so we got we got the banished kind of out of the way do we want to talk about some of the like battle of reach and the dynamic there the the big fight in the middle yeah yeah i thought that was super cool i i thought it was like it, the, the book the mission obviously what an escalation of we're here to insert super secret and get this thing out of a lab to yeah we're now fighting the banished off reach we're liberating reach I'm like fuck that's dope but again the way they had set it up of like that a certain scale of battle is going to trigger cortana like does this is like as like detonating a nuke there's no way we could hide that Cortana's going to see it so like i thought that was cool but i think it in my mind, it was always going to end with a Guardian or Katana showing up and then bailing. I, d- I didn't think they were going to take Reach back and then have, yay, we now own Reach. It was kind of nice that Cortana isn't directly um, impacting the story, but she's kind of indirectly this, you know, overarching, like, threat that, oh, we can't, we can't do these things because Cortana might see. So I'm kind of glad she hasn't, like, we don't see a Guardian, we don't see Cortana, she doesn't talk or anything like that. She's just an ever-looming, like, invisible threat, and I love it. Yeah, I love how um, the Banished are calling her the Apparition. I thought that's really cool. That thought that was dope. I also, like, Kelly won't even say her name anymore. It's like Voldemort. <laughs> she who must not be named. Like, Kelly doesn't want him to ta- say Cortana over their, even their um, team comm or anything like that. So the battle itself, I thought, was excellent. That's, for me, where the book kind of ramped up. I was kind of... It was very slow in introduction. I had to, but, like, the hot beginning of the crash to them walking and digging and moving underground and on, on the glass planet. And they have these slow vehicles. They have these slow excavation equipment, and, like, they're in tunnels for half of the book. Side note, Fred using the driller as, like, an anti-air thing sounded dope. <laughs> that was a cool scene. I thought that was pretty cool. And then seeing, like, the back and forward between when it cuts the caster, which is, like, a reveal in, like, the chapter 3 of, like, what they're seeing, what the Spartans are seeing, and both sides are completely wrong over, like, based on the information they have. I thought it was fascinating to see, like, their conclusions and how they reacted to, like, they think they're here for this, and these side think they're here for that, but they don't actually know. I thought it was cool. The, um, the battle for the battle of Reach in terms of they're taking this armory, this town, I'm forgetting what it was called. I think it banished armory is fine. <laughs> Everything about it was super cool. Digging underneath the walls, coming up the, inf- the stealth infiltration with the four Spartans, just taking over the base. Thought that was fucking cool. Like the explosives, planting explosives everywhere, blown. I thought it was all wonderful, all well done. Um, I loved 
every team member had like a job to do and you know you could see blue team working together as blue team and it felt great and then like bringing in the militia bringing in kind of like the take the taking and then the defending of it was so awesome and then the stuff that was happening with infinity when they realized that their ships still in space and stuff that they're trying to like block and defend and they had a brief kind of space battle that sounded incredible how like they trapped this the 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 corvette and then lined it up for infinity to mack it into oblivion like that whole sequence sounded awesome of how they adjusted their tactics how their spaceships have shields now and then like a million marauders and wraiths show up and it just like it's just insane and then all these broad swords come in or long swords come in and they're just fucking blowing shit up like i said earlier having john take over the battle and pretty much organize it sound that's was awesome that wasn't something i expected to see john do but obviously in his element this is what he's doing it's been done for years but we've never really seen it but have him take over the militia install people in better positions and just have like yeah you do this this plan is this and just seeing it happen was incredible and I, i thought it was really 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 cool everything just how it scaled up scaled up and then having like those gun emplacements sounded awesome. The anti-air stuff, the, the size. I'm like, fuck, they, they sounded awesome. And having... They they used, like, all their resources on this, which was insane. Yeah, that's what I thought was great of, like, how they had so much... They're so well-equipped because they're on reach, because they're, like, survivors and people who used to work in, like, this R&D in this lab. So, yeah, that's where we got our nukes from. And it makes sense because Reach is was a military compound. So, like, all of the survivors... Like, the Banished don't care about human technology, but the humans were at a great advantage, even though they didn't see it at first, because they had all of this UNSC equipment that they salvaged from all over the planet. They had crazy amounts of resources, so much so that they're like, oh yeah, we have like five Havocs, and Chief is like, what the fuck, are you joking? (laughs) I've only managed to hack into one, do you know what I mean? So I was like, Jesus, what the fuck are these people doing? It was really cool. I thought it. The whole battle, how it went, how it was described, awesome. And the whole scene with the Warthog, like I said, that they're planning on taking a Phantom and then it gets wiped out by their own force. UNSC is on the way in. They're doing like a hot drop with the Spart- 100 Spartans dropping in. Oh my God, that was amazing. That was so epic. When they specifically call out those two Spartan teams by name, do we assume they're significant for down the line? I almost felt like I was supposed to already know them. Tartarus and Intrepid, or what are they called? Something like that? I can't remember what they were called, but yeah, Tartarus, <laughs> Thoth, and thingy, but like, obviously they are like the ultimate team, almost like, I don't know, I kind of felt like that should have been Crimson or something, do you know what I mean? I felt like it should have been a team, teams that we already knew. Is Crimson still a thing? Didn't one of them die in a comic? Yeah, but like Crimson was the team you played as. Do you know what I mean? You were Crimson team. Uh, as Oh, that's right. You were Crimson, not Majestic. Majestic was the other team, yeah. But again, I would have expected the two teams to be Majestic and Crimson because they say that when John recognizes the, these team members and he's like, if they're here, they're the Uber team of Palmer's Spartan Fours. So that means they're here for the Havocs and stuff. I like the Chief kind of stands up for the Spartan Fours because he's like, Halsey has a bit of a thing about them because they're not like our level of physical perfection, but he's like, they're damn good soldiers and they're fully capable and I've trained uh, I've trained among them and I've fought alongside them and they're just good. He's like, he's totally just like, I'm good with this. These guys are good. A lot of them are deserve to be here. He doesn't have his nose stuck up about it or anything. No, and I don't think Chief would. In a way, he's almost, like, ready to pass the torch on to them, too. Like, he kind of marks them in his head as worthy. And this this happens throughout the entire book. Chief keeps talking about how he's old and how longer, how much longer he can, you know, you know, keep this up and how he's going to die. And I'm like, can we stop? I can't handle this. I don't want this. Fireteam Taurus and Fireteam Intrepid. These are two of the best crews Infinity had when it came to Spartan Force, trained explicitly for high-risk operations well behind enemy lines. That kind of sounds like you think it would have been Majestic and Crimson, but obviously they're retired now, so we have better teams who are not them. Fire Team Intrepid sounds familiar. It's like Intrepid Eye. You think maybe they were involved in previous books? I'll take a look there now, maybe we can see where these people are. Do we think Intrepid Eye? Because 
Now, this, this is this is going back to one of the other Troy Denning novels, isn't that one of, in Last Light, they discover this super powerful AI named Intrepid Eye, and then she kind of just messes with shit, and we don't know where she is. She escaped Argent Moon, which is the Oni facility, so she's a very powerful Forerunner AI. She kind of works on her own systems, like, she, she lost her facility, she sees what humans are doing with Forerunner technology, she's not super happy about it, because we destroy everything, and she just kind of She's like a chaotic neutral character where she just does whatever she thinks is right in the in the moment. Guys, I figured it out. Fire Team Taurus is a Mega Bloks team. Oh shit, really? All right, we got to get the Mega Bloks guys on this. There you go, Mega Bloks. That's probably that's why it's mentioned. Oh, so you can buy these and play with them. Devious product placement in our novel. How could Troy Denning do it? Tutu Troy tutu. Do you remember Apollo? Do you remember when we were Fire Team Apollo? No, I don't. I don't thing? remember that at all. Do you remember Krista? Krista, we're Fire Team Apollo. Do you know that? <laughs> no, I don't remember. We're the last. We're probably the last two members of Fire Team Apollo. I know Krista. everyone else is just abandoned. <laughs> that was the loot crate stuff. All right. Anyway, Intrepid Eye kind of does what whatever she wants. With Cortana kind of taking over all the Forerunner stuff, I would imagine Intrepid Eye isn't probably super happy about that because she's a human AI, and Intrepid Eye doesn't necessarily like humans. But do you think Intrepid Eye could be working with the UNSC at this point? She might be, but Intrepid Eye, well, she does like humans because she thinks humans are ready. Or humans the next are the mantle, so the she's mantle. 100% like, trying to prep. But I think that puts her in direct contention with Cortana then. Because Cortana is the one taking the mantle, and Intrepid's like, no, humanity are the ones supposed to have it. So that might give us our kind of force against her. I mean, would you be interested to see Chief working with Intrepid Eye instead of Cortana? We know, we know that's not true and that's not going to happen, but I think that would be interesting. Given how Fred's previous encounter with Intrepid Eye was, where she like locked down his armor and tried to kill him, I think it'd be really interesting to see them working together. That'd be cool. But then, you know, because of that, you know, Fred gets to, you know, be a sled for Veda. And, you know, he really enjoyed that. So maybe Intrepid Eye was just kind of like doing him a solid at that point. I found it interesting that Caster specifically said that the Oracle sent uh, the ferrets to him. Yeah, that's yes. really interesting. I wonder if Veda is probably working with Intrepid Eye and probably via Caster, you know, probably got in. That's how they got into the Keepers was like the Oracle going, here are my four super fans. Please let them join the Keepers. Yeah, I found it interesting because Fred specifically says that they went missing two years ago so that would be before this because this is a year after the shit that hit would the be fan, 25 which means they went missing they went missing yeah. before Cortana kicked off so could they have been on a mission and then been there when the shit hit the fan and then teamed up with Dark Moon and Intrepid I think definitely that's all possible and that definitely they were probably given a mission to do because like okay we haven't even talked about Veronica Dare is back that's at the very 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 end that's when they find that's the epilogue and so she seems to be like the only rep on Infinity so obviously whatever's left of Oni because Oni's probably obviously scattered and she kind of says that even when Oni wasn't like all over the place I didn't know everything or every battle but I got the impression that she was waiting for something and that she eat she was expecting for something from Veda. So obviously I think I got the impression that she knew Veda was out there doing something. Um, whatever that was, infiltrating the Keepers or keeping an eye on the Banished. Now just really quick, just to, you know, walk it back a second. Throughout the book we see these four humans and Castor mentions them multiple times and they're kind of doing his bidding and he really, he puts a lot of trust in them and stuff like that. And then at the very end of the book, Fred comes face to face with Veda and Veda's like, get the fuck out of here. Here's a message, boo, I love you, mwah. And then, <laughs> and then they run away. And then, of course, they go off to the Ark. So, Ferret Team is present in this. It's not revealed until the very end, but you get a lot of subtle hints throughout the book where you're like, hmm. They give you that giant hint the first time he mentions it's really like, I've heard them refer to the, the the female as mom, and they don't appear to be young enough to be her kids. And I was like, oh, it's the ferrets. When they they described her, and that didn't really mean anything to me, and then it was the we're referring to her as mom. I was like, why would they do it? A boom, ferret team. 
for a minute I was convinced they genuinely were only going to tease them and then never mention them again because as you keep going through the book you're like they never went back to the ferrets why wouldn't they go back to the ferrets and you're like is that going to be the only cock tease that the ferrets are in the background and then we're not going to hear from them this entire book I was convinced talk about like possible spin-offs like that's a cool story in itself of the ferret team infiltrating the keepers and then talking about after the meaning like, what happens now Aatrox is off the arc so whatever Halo Wars 3 is is like not versus Aatrox it's versus the rest of his forces and the keeper force we're going and the banished aren't going to activate the rings but the keepers are definitely going to try to activate the rings so then you now have three factions and maybe you know not including the flood of like that's awesome it's, it's so interesting. Troy Denning did a really good job at tying in all of his previous work into this, because at one point, Master Chief kind of looks back at when he's given the title of Master Chief, which is in the first uh, Master Chief novel, Silent Storm. It is. If you've read all the Troy novels, this novel is a, a much better payoff than if you haven't, though it is four novels. It's a lot. Also, like, Fall of Reach and uh, First Strike are kind of must-reads for this novel as well. <laughs> So be sure to read six books before you read this one book. <laughs> no, you don't have to do that crazy. No, you don't. You get something out of that scene, like these threads come being pulled. These old threads that have just been left hanging get pulled back into like recent Halo canon. That's really interesting. Can we talk about, since Halo 3, we hadn't had any mention of the arc for a really long time until up to Halo Wars 2. And now the arc is super present and it's amazing and I love it because the arc is like one of the coolest set pieces in the Halo universe. But now it's even more cooler because the Ferret team are there. And you have the Ferret, you've got Keepers, you've got Banish, you've got Flood, you've got the UNSC, Spirit of Fire, you got like, that's so cool. Thinking of all those things. Like, that's a whole series in itself. Alright, so do we want to talk about, right after the Battle of Reach, another huge battle happens, which is the fight to Sword Base, and the fight, not Sword Base, Castle Base, and the fight around Castle Base. Does anyone want to take this one? I talked a lot. Aaron, do you want to talk? Yeah, hey, I can talk for a bit, yeah. <laughs> we want to hear your voice. Let's see. We, we start off with, we have the very cool trench run through the mountains, which ends in a very sad death. And a bong, bong, bong. A ding dong. What a cool trench run, though. That was cool. Fucking sweet. Yeah, the idea that it's just three Spartans hanging out of the back of a pelican, and because of the way the canyon is, they can't be attacked from above, so they're literally just, like, shooting out the back. Oh, don't forget about Mackay. Yeah. Well, she's strapped in her seat. Shooting machine guns and stuff. But still, like, it, you never see, like, apart from, I think you see Johnson in Halo 3, he uses, like, the rear gunner turret at one point in the back of a pelican, but not much else. And you're like, that seems a little impractical. And then you find out, oh, they actually have a sling and it hangs from the roof now. That's how we take out the enemies behind us. They do their trench run, Chapov dies, but he gets them there in the end because he's an awesome pilot. And he actually takes out uh, an anti-air wraith by landing on it, which is like the coolest last move. And then they make their way up through the mountains. They find the bell. That was a good Easter egg where they they find they go through obstacle course. What, there's a name for it. What are they called? The playground? Yes, the playground. And then it's the bell, the chief rings. There's an awful lot of coming full circle in this book. Here you are, and this is the bell that you rang that very first day when you fucked up and, like, left the rest of the team behind. And I like the chief puts the silencer on his gun and shoots it three times. Yeah, when uh, Chapoff dies. Yeah, just, like, on the way past, and that's it done. And then they make their way up the mountain, and they go to, what do they call it, Medicate Mountain, or what's left of it? The Shaft. Yeah, First Strike or Fall of Reach, do they detonate the mountain? Fall of Reach? Yeah, First Strike is like the Battle of Reach. Fall of Reach is Chief like leaving Reach to go to Halo 1. That's right. So Halsey was last man standing. She set the the fail safes and they basically detonate and drop the entire mountain on the facility. But then the Covenant dig their way down into it. So they cleared the mountain. And then they bore the shaft right down to the Forerunner bit below the planet so there's this massive wide like what two kilometer shaft down into reach yeah and then the banish come along and of course it's full of muck and dirt and shit and water and everything else from lying here for seven years so the banished use the what do they call them pirate lifts they're basically 
gravity lifts. I love the idea that they're like loot lifts. They describe how the banished raid a planet, so because it takes too long to move loot and ships and all the rest, they drop a pirate lift and they launch the loot up into the ship that hovers over the city. The banished use it, they drop one lift down the shaft and then they pump all the sludge and crap out of it. And then they like direct it with a second lift and spray it off into like a little reservoir that they've made. The guys decide, oh well this is clearly the handiest way to go so they've got to get into it. Now I may not remember all of the battle, they get the broadswords to like make a run across the battlefield first and to loosen up the enemies and then the broadswords tell chief that oh we've got reinforcements coming and then the longswords come in and they chase off Iskaram's like little cruiser. And then there's a bunch of like jump pack brutes that funnel out of there. Oh the grey squad, that was a cool scene. They seem to be like Iskaram's personal guard or something because they're all super disciplined chief comments about how they're all lined up around the ship and none of them move and then he notices they're all like running into the hangar bay and he thinks you think they're retreating and then he talks about as the ship takes off they're actually all jumping back out and he's like oh no they're jetpack brutes jetpack brutes with infusion infusion gel launchers from halo wars 2 are weakening nightmare stuff they're finding the red gel that burns true stuff awesome love seeing that again Hope that's in Halo Infinite. It's dope. They take out broadswords with it? Yeah, they do. And fuck up Chief with it too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they get him in the... They get him in the lift, don't they? Yes, I think so. Somewhat one of the brutes shoots up the lift and catches him, so... The longswords chase off the ship. They give them air cover. The team then have to go... I think about 13 or 14 jetpack brutes make it down the shaft first. And then blue team are like right we have to go down after them so they're doing like a fast repel they clip the rope to the back of their armor and then they leap face first down into the mine shaft and they're like leaping 10 feet at a time and making their way down there and this is the point when blue team they realize they're like the the banished board a lot further down because up until now they think the banished have been following them to get to halsey's lab and then this is the moment where it clicks and they go No, the Banished wanted the Forerunner facility all along. They make their way down and they kick all sorts of ass and have a gravity lift fight. And Chief uses his uh, grapple shot to take out... He uses his grapple shot and one of the new weapons, the Pelham? Pelham? Palum? How do we pronounce that? (laughs) Pelham. I don't know. It sounds like a sort of rocket launcher Uh, I I was saying to the guys before the show. I googled it and a pillum is a type of javelin. And at one point, Chief shoots a brute that's standing in like the entrance to Castle Base, which is halfway, or like two thirds of the way down the shaft. And he talks about how he shoots him in the eye and then it detonates and like launches Chief on down the shaft. So it sounds like some sort of like pointy missile launcher and not quite an, a rocket launcher. But I couldn't, I had awful trouble like visualizing what this weapon was. But also Chief uses his now inbuilt active camel. Yes, they all have that now, but it's not great. Well, it sounds like it depends on who you're hiding from. If you're hiding from, it does like the regular active camel. So if you sprint or run, it's not so good. If you're standing still or moving slow, it's fine. But it heats you up a little bit and causes a few things that you show up in sensors so it sounds like good for hiding from ground troops bad for hiding from aircraft or maybe sentinels it sounds like it has built-in limitations so that you're not too op but it maybe gives us a hint at stuff you might get in infinite like built-in abilities that could be changeable or modifiable i'd love active camo that would be great I'd love to see what else there could be. Armor lock, overshield, maybe other things. Could you swap this out? Because we were, during the battle scene at the city earlier, they mentioned like a portable Spartan bay. What it's called is a portable Spartan support module. Which sounds very much like a workshop where you take your credits to get upgrades. Or something, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you'd have credits. It might be some other form of resource. Yeah, we like we we know there's like two or three types of currency collectible in Infinite from the the like screenshots. Yeah, but it wouldn't make sense why you would go to this thing and pay for an upgrade with money. 
Well, I say credits, but what if it's nanobots? What if you're just harvesting nanobots? It's probably like energy. What if it's you're harvesting energy or power or something bad, something to make it run, or you need raw materials? Yeah, I, I got a sidetrack there, but like they clearly they have stuff like this in it. Where'd we leave off? Oh, Chief was going down the, the shaft to the bottom. Blue team find out that the shaft goes further than their descent ropes do. And then, is it Kelly was at the top? Linda, I think. Kelly was at the top. Oh, Kelly? Because he had, Linda has a sniper, John has the pillum, and Fred has the spanker. Because they're like, we're taking these fuckers down one or two hits. Yeah, Kelly makes her way down to give Chief a hand, but Kelly makes it the whole way down because she gets uh, Mc Mackay to tie a couple of ropes together so it goes a bit further. So she like gets the whole way down and gives Chief a hand. And Chief is like, that's not supposed to be used that way, but okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll not tell him if it works or, or her. Chief's also fighting this whole time with like a lump missing out of the back of his leg because he was injured at one point. So like at the very beginning. Yeah, he's pretty fucked up through most of this. He has this hole in his leg and they've kind of patched him up, but he's not 100%. He forgets himself occasionally and like jumps through places and lands on the bad leg. He's like, oh, I'm going to regret that. <laughs> they clear the bottom of the shaft and then they take the mining equipment down and then they clear their way into Halsey's lab and then they split up. So we've got Fred goes on down into the Forerunner facility and he's following a tunnel that the Banished made because he wants to see what they're doing. And this is when he meets up with Veda as well. Yeah, he finds her in the tunnels and she like passes him a note and then fakes it that she like shoot him away which is kind of cute that she's like you've got to run and then she shoots and he's like Get away, did she try to miss my head or not <laughs> he thinks that the bullet holes are a little too close for comfort he has to retreat then because he wanted to he didn't want to go back to the infinity and tell Durr that they didn't find out what the banished were looking for down there he was afraid he'd get in trouble <laughs> and then meanwhile you've got uh, Chief and Kelly yes Kelly and they have to do, like, limbo and make their way through the, like, rubble of Halsey's lab to get to the safe. Yes. And then Chief basically holds up an entire mountain. Yeah, and also they see spooky eyes. Lots of spooks. The spooky eye that's looking at him isn't... What do we call her? Kumia. Yeah, it's Kumia. Is it what's left of her? It's just this program. That's all it is. She, like, remembers a little bit of what happened to her. It's a splinter. She's just there to, like, make sure that Dr. Halsey doesn't, like, get in there. Or no one except Dr. Halsey gets in there. Is that who the eye on the desk was as well? Because for a minute I was like, is that not Kilmaya too? I was going to be like, is there someone else? Because he waves at her at the end and she, like, leaves. Yeah, that's that's all I think it is. I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything more to it than that. We weren't hinting at anything else before I overthink that. They go to break into Halsey's lab and Halsey's given them a special glove to fake her handprint and then special contact lenses. The only thing Halsey didn't account for was that there would be a subroutine left behind that would go, you're not Halsey, you can't come in. Well, she, did, she, did, she didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but she knew there might be something, so she gave him the passphrase. Whatever it takes, just like the Avengers. <laughs> I think she's used it before. I think even in the early, early novels, you've had her say, say this before to like delete memories and stuff like that from Spartans or AI. I think this isn't the first time she said this. This is the like thing she put into all the AIs or something like that. Yeah, her back door. They get Halsey stuff, which, as we speculated, is three cryo tubes and a crate. The crate, I think, comes from Sword Base. I think that's where we're getting Sword Base from. Is the box is stamped with a seal that belongs to Sword Base, and then there's the three cryo tubes, which are the brains, which is what we were speculating on a while back that we're definitely getting a new Cortana. If not a triad, an AI triad. A uh, sexy Cortana threesome. Yeah. Well, in, in Dr. Halsey's journal, she talks about how she made the four brains. Three of them she was going to, you know, just keep in stasis until technology improves. Of course, now she definitely needs them because shit's gone wacko. And she has a theory that if you have three separate AI matrixes, which you need three separate brains to create, 
if you make them into almost one AI, they would never go rampant because one matrix would always would always take the mantle while the other two rested or something like that. It has to do with like this triad where three AI makes like a perfect AI. She describes it as something like where they'd all share the decision making among themselves and like this is they'd like reach consensus before they do anything. So it sounded like if they share the load then you can't go insane because it's all spread out. We we thought about this for a while, that they had that trailer for Infinite and then they had some Cortana audio that didn't sound like Cortana because it's Cortana saying, it's me, but it's not me. Yeah. That would make sense if you were going to have... Because we've also mentioned that Kilmaya looks like Cortana, but a bit different. Yeah, it's like her sister. Her older sister, that's an interesting way to... So she like he described that version as she had her hair braided and tied around her head and a dress. And you could totally see like another AI made from Halsey's brains would totally sound like Cortana but look a little different. Cortana's little sister. Yeah, basically. Or is it a three banged AI that is Kilmaya, Cortana and some something else? And it's like a trifecta of those three personality types or something weird like that. Perhaps. Kind of like all three of them in one. I think it would be cool to have three distinct versions of the one avatar that it could cycle through, depending on what the situation is and what the AI's mood was. Like that adds a little variety to things. You could get a bit more creative, you know, if you have the sort of slightly more aggressive AI that's, you know, if you're in a fight, she's the one you're going to see. And if you're doing sciencey puzzle stuff, you get a different one. And things like that like it leaves it open for interesting ways to represent it because it's still one ai also it's definitely not going to have a name because chief's not going to be able to bring himself to have a new pet so it's going to be the weapon because i think isn't there something about weapon not present in like those when people broke down like the screenshots of the armor boot from the first trailer it was like weapon not found or weapon not active. You could totally see the chief would just call this the weapon. I don't know. That that could just be that he has no weapons on him. I would I would I would almost take it that literally because isn't that the intro to the game? You starting off with no weapons. Or even the AI because AIs choose their own name and identity. An AI that knows Chief's history with Cortana might know the chief won't be attached to another one. Maybe we go for a slightly more impersonal, you can call me the weapon. Maybe. Or maybe that's just a code name for what it is, so they don't reveal what it is. It opens a lot of stuff up. Now the Chief's getting more personal and having inner monologues and he's struggling with social issues. What better than to have a new AI that looks like your ex? <laughs> I think it's also cool that he is um, trying to be more social and making more of an effort. I think that's interesting as well. I think really, like, the lack of Cortana is pushing him to do stuff like that more. He's realised he's like a role model and he has to do things for people and put them at ease and just generally be supportive, whereas he never would have thought of that before. Hmm, yeah. I'm glad they brought the brains back in, though. That was a great thread from the Halsey's Journal that is good to see revisited. There's a lot of that in this book, though. (laughs) Yeah, oh, I, I can't wait to see what it is. Yeah, because they obviously don't explain exactly what she's going to be doing or anything like that. She just gets the she gets the stuff and she's like, thanks. And then the book ends. It's like, fuck. Yeah, like she doesn't tell anyone what exactly her plan is. And I get the feeling Chief doesn't 100% know what the plan is because he's just, uh, Halsey has a plan. We're here to do it. And it sounds like Lasky knows what it is and Lasky doesn't want to know what it is. Lasky is just, he just thinks he knows what's in them. I don't think he knows anything about her plan. That's true. He has a fairly good idea. I'm imagining it is just to make this trifecta AI. That's the plan. And then that is the thing to fight Cortana is what I'm guessing it is. Plus whatever's in the third box. You know what this shit is? Cortana is just um, medicant bias and Halsey's just making offensive bias. It's his- It feels like history repeating itself. History repeats all over the place. It happens time and time again. That's probably what's going to happen here is this AI will beat the living fuck out of Cortana. (laughs) Halsey has a moment like, goes like, Halsey took the box from John, traced her fingertips along the Aver saber imprinted on its lid and looked up at him again. This is not going to be easy, John. I get the image. She looked at the cryo bins inside then walked to the hangar mouth and started to change blah, blah, blah. 
I like the idea that it's like, it is the only option we have. It's whatever it is, I think, is going to be something that John doesn't like and that no one else likes doing either. It's obviously she's ashamed of the, the contents and what she has to do. Well, she knows that it's it's highly illegal for her to be cloning these brains and have possession of them anyway. So what she's doing is going to probably just dig a bigger hole for her. Because she's al- pe- people already hate her already, so now she has to reveal... Because, I mean, they're going to ask where this AI came from, of course. Eventually the truth is going to come out. And then, of course, the UNSC has to use this asset that was obtained illegally. Just like they have to use the Spartan 2s, which were obtained illegally. <laughs> Yeah, I still think that's what's going to be Chief's personal struggle will be this is another version of Cortana. That's going to be what he doesn't like. Like That's going to be what he's going to have to deal with is this thing. And then Halls, he's going to have to deal with, I've done my final barbaric act. I've taken these three clone brains of myself and I've built the super AI. Human AIs up until now have been no match for Forerunner AIs. And this will be her like, this AI is as good as a Forerunner and it will help us all. And then Chief has become the didact. History repeats itself. I like it, actually, though. I think it's really good. (laughs) And then they all settle down on the planet and they launch the infinity into the sun and then we find out that it was Earth all along. Oh, no! (laughs) It's going to be interesting. It feels like this book is giving us a lot of hints at what's going to happen in Halo Infinite, but it's not going to give us any answers of what's going to happen in Halo Infinite, which I I appreciate. I know 343 are trying to kind of separate the book stuff from the game stuff so you can still understand the games because people get salty like, what do you mean I have to read books to understand this? Realistically, what they've shown, I think it's something that it's going to be in Infinite, that they introduced a few new weapons, they introduced a few new vehicles, they introduced these new characters, and just like, here they are, but nothing really detailed about them. I think you'll you'll get everything you need from the games, but you're obviously going to be like, oh shit, there's this guy I read in Shadows of Reach. I like that. The other thing is, they probably didn't intend on us having to now wait a year to get these answers, because this book was going to come out, like what, two months before Infinite? It was going to come up out in September, end of September. And then I guess Infinite would be around November. So we'd have a whole month to read the book before. Right. So one thing I've been wondering while we've been reading the book is originally my money was on Chapoff kind of being the pilot. But I was thinking like, he's too young and he doesn't have a family. And then I was going, I wonder is it Van out? Because he makes it back to the ship. What if he was just the pilot? Maybe. I mean, I felt like that too. There was a couple spots where I thought Chapov could totally be the pilot and then maybe he found Hoot. I don't know. I think David mentioned this before we started recording, but it feels like there's not a lot of familiarity in the Halo Infinite trailers between the pilot and Chief when he finds him. That's the only thing that I like. I like the idea that that may be why they haven't revealed his name because that is who he is. But even like... Their relationship seems very different in this book than it is than what we've seen even in the trailers and gameplay of between Chief and the pilot. And I just didn't get the vibe that it was him because it felt like their meeting for the first time in the Halo Infinite trailer was the meeting for the first time. That's just the only thing that would turn me off him being him being Van Van Out. What if they were your crew? What if Van Out and what if you picked up uh, Mackay along the way and they were like your pelican crew I love that I love the idea of, that you could have crews like that that you have like a support team maybe someone there using the module to help you update your stuff if the pelican was like your midi base you know on the map like if it's your like small base that you could go back to between missions it would be cool to have a couple of NPCs there to do stuff with Devil. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be, there has to be an NPC or something talking to Chief and guiding him along if he's not going to have an AI throughout this game. And if there is not an engineer shopkeeper that upgrades your equipment, I'll also be very upset. I hope he has like a little hat too. If engineers wore hats, would they wear it on like their little tentacle face or do you think they'd wear it on like the big part of their body? No, you wear it on your little tentacle head because you wouldn't wear a hat on your back, would you? I don't know. Well, I mean, most if he's using a human hat, it's not going to fit on his tentacle head, but it probably would fit on his big sack. What if he made a little tiny hat and then had a big trench coat over his sack? 
And just like dragging on the floor. You like you pull up to him and he's like, I've got wires for sale and opens his coat up and you can see like assault rifle parts. <laughs> can I interest you in an under barrel grenade launcher? If there is an engineer and it does upgrade your stuff, I want to see the engineer actually do that because we've heard, you know, books and novels and shit of them like quickly dismantling and re-putting together stuff. It would be cool to see that in person. All you're going to see is their tentacles are going to go shimmery and stuff's going to reassemble. Like, that's it. It's going to be magical, though. I want to see it. What stuff do we think is like an infinite setup? What what do we... Like, there's some equipment. They mentioned some There's a lot of equipment, we've... yeah. The grappling hook. Yeah, the grapple hook has been revealed. The stealth. The J. That's probably going to be a thing. There's definitely... I like the idea of maybe marauders being vehicles. In, in they, There's got to be marauders present, right? So bringing them from Halo Wars into the, the game, that's got to be dope. There's mentions of reavers. I don't know if you see, if you see them, but there's obviously a lot of anti-air stuff, even in the, the infinite like demo we got we got some anti-air stuff but obviously there wasn't reavers there oh i i would be willing to bet the full yeah banish suite okay cool they have these siege weapons these kind of that were described as being like weapons that are like used for like anti-vehicles that like the banished love using on troops they're like i can't remember what they're called they're only they're mentioned in the armory when john kind of first infiltrates what are they yeah they sound like a rocket launcher sort of a yeah he, he, he thought they were um going to be fusion cannons but they weren't fusion cannons they fired something else i was gonna say we've got the emulsion guns as well the... yeah the, inf- the infusion gels infusion emulsions the stuff from gears that's it yeah the infusion gels pretty much the exact same stuff just halo fight so i think that's great to see in this book that's definitely going to be in in infinite what else have we got Well, we have the Pelham, we have the target designator that straps onto the bottom of your assault rifle. Underbarrel guns, yeah, laser designating stuff. That would be cool if that that was something you could do. What if you could do multiple attachments to your assault rifle? Because it sounds like... They did call it the universal attachment slot or whatever under the gun. So that that implies, can we finally get our grenade launcher? Yeah, they've spent so many years talking about grenade launchers, like it seems like a no-brainer. Underbarrel shotgun, that's what we really need, David. Oh, oh, I do like them. Intriguing. I want to see more of this. Other than that, I think obviously you got all the characters that were introduced. Do we think blue team's going to be in Halo Infinite? Oh, that's such a good question. Like, if there's a huge assault going out, if the Infinity goes to the ring and drops a bunch of troops, why would they only drop Chief? They do still send blue, they do still split up blue team. Do you know what I mean? Because Linda had her own comic book series that was just Linda being sent on solo missions. And you'd imagine Fred has obviously done it before in the past. So you they do split them up and send them on other missions so they could easily explain it away. But then maybe, I don't know, I, I think with obviously the co-opness that's obviously very important to halo i could see them canonically having like halo 5 and have blue team with you the whole time but the demo kind of plays a little bit differently i don't know it's weird to see i'd like it if they were back because there's more work to be done with those characters i would hope it would be a situation where maybe you play the intro and everyone plays the intro and you play as chief but then when you get into the campaign it's four players you know you can drop in and out the same as Halo 5 and they're just there. You know, you may have to do something to meet up with them. Like, it could be something as simple as that. Go find Fred or something. Yeah, you'll open up the world and then you'll have them. Worst case, if they did it like Halo 3 where the other players just join your game and they become one of Blue Team, it's all right, but I'd rather have Blue Team there as, like, voiced characters so we could get some more Blue Team banter. It would be a little sad if we didn't. And also, I kind of wouldn't want to go back to co-op characters being four chief clones. Yeah, I think we're all kind of spoiled at this at this point. Yeah, like, if there's something nice to be said about when you play as Osiris or you play as Blue Team, you get that character banter and you are the different characters and you get a slightly different loadout with each of them. I would like it if we got that again. It's either that or it's you're just a generic Spartan 4 or something. You're just a generic Spartan. I don't know. It's weird to, it's weird to think about. I hope I hope they bring Blue Team into it. 
Um, other than that, obviously they've named a bunch of banished characters that are, I think are definitely going to be in this. Yeah, like when Atriox comes out of the portal, he obviously brings a bunch of his main commanders with him. Speaking of Atriox, do we think we're actually going to see Atriox in this game? No, he'll be a way off at whatever his other secret mission is. The fact that they've built up a Skarm, which could be just to wait for the book, not let the book have that reveal of Atriox being there. He could be there and not there. Do you know what I mean? A Skarm, I got the impression of, because even his speech about him, um, he talks about Didact almost as being not, not Didact, sorry, but talks about Atriox as being not, you know what I mean? His will be done. It's either the fact that Atriox is left him behind to do whatever the way Atriox moves on. He left the Ark after he failed there. Maybe he failed at the ring. He left the ring and moved on to something else. I got the impression that like Iskarum, this is just from the very bit to his little speech, is just almost maybe he is in sh- living kind of in exile. He's there like in shame because of the failure of that mission. Or maybe it succeeded. Yeah, I think the Banished succeeded in taking the ring. I think it's the UNSC that failed. That's true. But but didn't he feel kind of dejected and then suddenly energized when he realized Johns was still around and he still had a fight? I think the issue is Eshiram doesn't do well, like, sitting around, and I think his job might have been to just hold the ring after the UNSC failed, and then he just ran out of shit to do, because they hunted down all the humans and shit like that, and of course, like, regular marines are super boring, so I think he was probably just sitting around there, twiddling his thumbs, getting all upset that he didn't have anything to do, and then Master Chief comes, shows up, and he's like, ah, shit, now I got a lot of shit to do, this is awesome. Yeah, and it kind of makes sense if they have this, like, shared history from being on Reach the year before that, you know, he's going to be excited to have another chance to get this motherfucker. Yeah, definitely. Because everyone knows who Chief is. Everyone. The demon. Bum, bum, bum. What else? Do we think anyone on... Do we think, like, we're going to see anyone that is currently on the Infinity? Or do you think they've pieced out? So we're going to see Lasky, Halsey, Palmer. Or do you think it's just going to be a Chief story of Chief being the last... Not the last survivor, but one of the last major survivors of Installation 04s? I don't think Infinity can be there, given this how the game introduces you to it. I think Infinity bailed out. And it could be the fact that a Guardian showed up, fucked everybody up, and then Infinity had to leave again. Because we know from from the book, we know that if a guardian is imminent and coming in, in incoming, the infinity doesn't care who they're leaving behind. Of course, they care about them, but they know that they have to survive to win the war. Because they left a bunch of UNSC units on Planet Reach who weren't going to make it up to the infinity before a guardian showed up. Yeah, I still think my money is on. I think the infinity won't be there. But I don't think a Guardian's fucked anyone up. I think someone set the Halo off. And that's why there's ships lying all over the place and all these dead signals in space. I'd be willing to bet someone was ready to detonate the Halo and the Infinity had to peace out and go, oh, we can't be here. And like you said, the Infinity will run if they have to, so they left behind the support fleet and that's where you pick up when this game starts. That's actually an interesting theory because Installation 07 is actually part of the Senescent Array, which could do localized pulses that didn't have to be these huge, you know... I kind of get the impression they all can because in Halo 3, Guilty Spark talks about doing a tactical pulse on the arc, and that gave me the impression that it sounded like it was going to be localized, like he was just going to... Because it destabilizes the portal and Chief doesn't make it back to Earth, but, like, Chief didn't immediately vaporize. Like, his... He didn't liquidize. So I kind of wonder, can you... Even if they didn't, like, we don't know where... We don't know where this Halo is in the galaxy. Like, they could have just wiped out a whole chunk of the galaxy and been like, yeah, that Halo detonated. And the only people that survived were on the Halo. We're probably getting way off topic of the book, though. Yeah, probably. We're, we're getting into Halo Infinite, but or, or pretty big now. But I, 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 I don't know too if too much is coming. Too much more than that from the book. I think they tell us not to look too much into it, and they're probably right. It's our job to look too much into it. Though. They would say that. <laughs> okay, what other major tie-ins do we want? Do we think uh, might happen into Infinite? I think we might be at our limit of what we can pull out of this. Queen 
Queen on the soundtrack? That would be amazing. I'd be so happy. <laughs> you you find Kelly's iPod and listen to some tunes while you like kill the banished. Yeah. Oh, th- those are your collectible items. There's what it's going to be. You're going to find Kelly's MP3 files just scattered around the ring. Apparently, I don't think so because Troy has said on Twitter, I'm afraid I did cut it, the song Killer Queen, before sending the draft. I was worried about copyright infringement, but we all know what song she was listening to. So I think they don't have the rights to Queen, so it's probably not going to be in the game. It's probably really expensive. Microsoft just spent billions on Bethesda if anyone can license it. Wait a second, what if you boot up a computer on like one of the terminals or something and it's just the beginning of Skyrim? <laughs> hmm. Oh, you're no, here. We're done. Oh, you're That's awake. It. That's it. Everyone, thank you for listening. Can this they has put been your Skyrim and Halo Infinite? <laughs> no, no, we're done, Krista. Out, out, come on. Like the Infinity, we need to evac. Okay, one more thing. Uh, let's go over some of the maybe not Halo Infinite related universal events, but some of the implications to the larger universe, like humanity has taken back Reach for now. That is pretty cool, but obviously they've said that like, and they did say the the pioneers, people who were there kind of like trying to rebuild the planet, that they were perfectly fine if Cortana does show up with a guardian, because they'll just ally themselves with them and peacefully repopulate the planet or re kind of deal the planet. So that's kind of interesting. Cortana would obviously probably help them make the planet viable again, which would actually be good, because I think Cortana probably still has a soft spot for Reach anyway, because she still has a soft spot for John. And definitely the reveal of a portal being there, I think, would warrant the presence of a Guardian at all times, so I imagine it's going to be Reach will be pretty well Cortanaized, be a created world from from now on, I think, because you can't not leave a Guardian there, I don't think. So that's obviously the big implication there. Obviously, UNSC, they leave forces at the end there. They say that, like, we have to bail before the sun, and they leave a bunch of pelicans and an albatross. So, like, there's going to be some of those troops and stuff left behind. They're going to just have to do the best they can. Like I said, they're going to rebuild a home. That's kind of what they say. They're, there's worse jobs out there that these guys could have. So that's kind of interesting. I think, obviously, the wider impact of the Ark being having the Keepers there and the Ferret team on site is really interesting. Fuck yeah, that whole theatre of war becomes more interesting now. And obviously, I think, opens up potential for maybe stories to be told there in book form and maybe maybe more in, in game form and stuff. So that's cool. Finally, I think we have the kind of tidbit of Intrepid Eye is still at large in the universe and very much involved. And trying its best to shape humanity in one way or the other. Yeah, whether it's directly or indirectly. So I think we'll see more from Intrepid Eye in the future. Oh, you know she hates Cortana. Oh yeah, she's fucking pissed. It's gonna be a lady fight. I'm excited. I hope it's fun. <laughs> Virtual mud fight. Virtual mud fight. Interesting. I think that's about it for just kind of the overall implications that came out of this book. The big ass book. There's a lot of saying about it. Do we want to go over, like, our final thoughts on the book and then we'll get out? Quickly, book starts off a bit slow for me. The use of the word let lower light or whatever. Just Lechetta Lyrite. Le- Lechetta Lyrite. Every other fucking sentence. Yeah, that totally just melted my brain. I think it started a bit slow. It had a cool insertion, kind of drop. I thought the maneuver was pretty badass. Got a bit slow in the middle for me and really picked up with the, the battle, the kind of the huge battle that took place and kind of really got really fast at the end the end of the book is where all the gems are yeah where you literally. get the reveal of all the characters is just so fascinating having castor in it and castor being really cool i like him a lot actually um i find it all very interesting i think where it leaves how it picks up these ancient old threads uh, in halo lore and brings them makes them current ties them up nicely i think and sets off interesting places to tell new stories super cool really interesting in how it moves the world along and obviously sets up for what is infinite overall i think a pretty solid great book uh, i'm really happy with it the, like literally everything i read today was like fuck yeah it was so it was just like literally couldn't put it down like gotta finish this book it's so good Hi. So, that's what i say david said a lot of what i'm thinking here it's a good book i enjoyed it i didn't find the like reach colonist stuff as much of a slog as i think you guys did but overall i liked a lot of it 
like you said, find out Caster's there and the ferrets are there and finding out that they were going to reach for what we thought they were going for, like all that stuff sets up so much potential that it just leaves me in overdrive trying to figure out what we're going to get coming f- going to the next game. The only thing it makes me want now is another ferret story because I feel like we need to wrap that arc up. We can't, like, pardon the pun, we can't leave them on the arc without wrapping their arc. If we had a novel that kind of spanned where they've been the last two years up into what they're doing next, I would like, I would appreciate that a lot. Or an Intrepid Eye novel, like, wrap them all into one because that story's all very much tied together. It just makes me want one of those, so I'm kind of hoping this is not his last novel and we get another one. I doubt it. It seems like 343 have really come to enjoy working with Troy Denning, and I think we all uh, enjoy it as well. For me, I definitely agree, agree with David that um, it got a bit slow in the middle, which is fine. I, I feel like Troy Denning's novels always get slow towards like the middle, you know, two-thirds in-ish. But I feel like Troy Denning always does a good job at rewarding you from kind of for kind of uh, getting through some of the slow parts. I think the payoff is always amazing in the Troy Denning novels. I think this novel does a great job at kind of throwing a bunch of threads out there that have been previously abandoned and kind of reintegrating them into the Halo universe. I think it was very rewarding for a longtime fan to read this book because there is just so much of that. And I think it does a really good job at kind of just, it's not giving you direct tie-ins or getting you set up for Halo Infinite. It's setting up the overarching universe for what Halo Infinite is going to take place in. And I think that's what he does really well in this novel. Is that about it, boys? I think that's us. All right, we're we're gone until the next Halo novel. (laughs) Yeah, whenever the fuck that is. Who knows? Who knows? I don't think it's going to be before Halo Infinite, though. Not not at this rate. They probably didn't plan on another one before the original date, but now anything's possible because God knows when that's coming out. Sometime in 2021, I guess. Ugh. I know. Now the great wait begins. We've consumed all the Halo media, and now we wait for the new Halo media. I don't like waiting. I know, I don't like it either. Let's just storm 343's headquarters and demand answers. Give us the Halo Bible, and then we'll buy them lunch or something. Anyway, (laughs) thank you for joining us. You can find every episode of all of our shows on our website, halopodcastevolved.com. It also features links to our Discord server, Facebook groups, Patreon page, Xbox Live Club, and our other personal contact information, Twitter, stuff like that. If you want to leave us a voicemail about this episode or a previous episode... We usually play them during our live Podcast Evolved news episodes. Be sure that the voicemails are something you would like other people to hear and include your name so we can properly thank you. If you'd like to send us a voicemail, give us a call at 205-EVOLVED. That's 205-386-5833. And with that, I have been your host, Krista. Until next time, Evolved. Evolved. Evolved.